You know, as we learn to improvise, we all end up with these phrases that we play with a fair amount of regularity, you know, repetition. These ideas um, often are in the form of licks, and they generally help us identify our musical personality, or at least provide a musical personality that uh, others can recognize as we play, you know. So while I don't think it's a good thing to base your entire solo around licks and uh, uh, licks and motifs, things like that, I do think it's good to have a bank, a good bank, a good repository of these licks to draw from that often will provide motifs for development, you know, themes, those sorts of things, and just, uh, the, again, the things that make us sound like us. These ideas can come from transcriptions or just from listening to great players. Sometimes we even just play something as a mistake, and, it, and we really like it and hang on to it. And many of the things that, uh, that I play now, um, I've been playing for years, and they often started out as maybe little fumbles or mistakes, and I said, hey, I kind of dig that, and uh, play it again, and then it starts to take its own shape and really becomes a part of my musical personality. Now, the way I'd like to approach this series, and uh, first I'd like to thank one of my long-term subscribers, Ronaldo. He sent me a message um, asking for more lessons on licks, language, and vocabulary. So I thought I would start a series called Licks, Language, and Vocabulary. Um, and um, I, think it's, um, I think it's a pretty good start that I've got here. In set one, I've got a baker's dozen. So there are, there are 13 of these licks. And I go through these licks, these different licks, and I help you understand how the lick is created, how to practice it in different keys so that you can um, really start to develop this bank of licks, not just in one specific key, but that are that are portable. They can be used in different uh, different keys and also give you suggestions on where and how you might be able to use them. So what I'd like to do is just, uh, at this point, I'm just gonna play one of these licks straight through for you, one of the videos. Again, it's a baker's dozen, so if you purchase the set, you'll have, uh, you'll have 12 more to choose from. And uh, remember, you can purchase these at beginningsax.com or you can subscribe to my my complete lesson series. Um, everything's accessible to you there at randyhunterjazz.vhx.tv. So check out this uh, this lick from the series. They're all relatively short, you know, and, you know, around six, eight, ten minutes at the most for most of these licks. So uh, I hope you uh, I hope you dig these this idea and uh, enjoy this lick that is a freebie for you and then um, then visit my sites and maybe pick up the whole series. Okay? <laughs> So, there I played Lick 5 that we learned in our previous episode of this series, and I also followed it with the lick I'll show you today. Now, this lick is really a great lick that can be applied to dominant chords, and it's really a very bluesy sound, so it works well on the blues, uh, it works well in a column response kind of situation, but the individual components of it also work very well just on dominant chords in general. Now, um, the lick comes from a Buddy Tate solo on a tune called No Kidding, and uh, this was um, from a transcription that a student of mine and one of your fellow uh, subscribers, Dan, did some time back, and um, we found just all kinds of great vocabulary and language and um, just great blues, classic blues sorts of sounds in that solo. Now, I'm not going to let this series turn into a blues series, but when you're talking about dominant chords, you really have to address the blues and, you know, dominant chords in general. So we'll get into uh, how dominant chords work within the context of two fives and, and in other situations as well um, with some of our language, but I definitely wanted to make sure that we include some of these types of sounds. Now, if you recall, lick number five went up um, a major blue scale, and it really kind of um, it really kind of targeted notes like the flat three to the three. We can maybe call that a blues neighbor tone, the flat tone, uh, the flat three to the three, and then you know the uh, target tone of that lick was um, eventually the dominant seven. <laughs> Okay, now we're not going to go any more into that one today, but this lick uses some of the same vocabulary, but it goes the opposite direction. So rather than an ascending lick, we're doing 
And we're really targeting notes and using notes primarily that are in the dominant arpeggio. And I'm playing in C7 on tenor saxophone. So there I played C, E, G, B flat. That's one, three, five, and dominant seven, minor seven, however you want to think of it. Now, let's think of some, uh, some neighbor tones to the five, really the lower neighbor, the flat five. We can think of it as the flat five, and we could even maybe think of it as a blues neighbor. So the, the flat five on a C chord is an F sharp. So we've got the blues neighbor to the five, a half step below the five. Then the blues neighbor to the major third. So we've got the minor third pulling into the major third. Then the root, followed by the dominant seven. Now, this is different than just a regular straight up blues scale lick because, you know, in the blues scale lick, we've got the minor third. So the blues scale lick works all the way across a chorus of the blues uh, if we were playing just a straight blues scale lick. But this is such a bluesy sound that is still very chordally specific. Now, like we did in our previous, um, in our previous lick, on, in lick five, we took that around the different chords that are in the blues. We could do the same with this one. So in C7, our one chord is C7. Maybe I'll play it twice because we basically got four bars on that C7 chord. Then I could play the same lick up a fourth on the F7 chord, starting, you know, transposing it to the F chord. So uh, the flat five to the five on the F chord. Then back to the one chord. Now, if we've got a quick 5-4 turnaround, we might just have time to play. So there you see I'm just uh, I'm truncating or abbreviating that lick so that it still hits those, uh, those chord tones. Now, I might choose to mix and mingle this with the lick that we did last time, lick 5. Question. Now the answer... Man, such a such a neat call and response kind of thing. Listen to that one more time. Two, three. So, you know, if you were to practice the entire lick in the context of the blues, you might just run it around the changes, work it, putting it in different places on the changes. It doesn't always have to come on one. I mean, we're playing and one and two and three, four and. I mean, it could be and three and four and one, two and. You might even segment it, maybe just part of it. Um, you don't have to play the flat five to the five twice, maybe just once. You know, uh, you could uh, do other things like So there you hear I'm octave displacing the final couple of notes and taking them up high. So, um, you know, you could always just use the last part of the lick. So maybe if I had a quick four change, you know, the one chord to the four chord, back to the one for two bars, I might just use the second half of the lick on the one chord and the quick four. Then maybe the whole thing. You know, so this is a really versatile lick that can be used throughout the blues. And, and this one um, has, um, yeah, you know, and it can be segmented, just little bits and pieces of it. And as long as you're keeping up with where you're at on the chords as you play the blues, you could certainly use it on the different chords and transpose it to like the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. Now, um, I mentioned in, in uh, with lick five that you might put on your I reel and use the simple blues 
and uh, change it to different keys and work it like that. You could also take this look and practice it with the trade and fours with the blues series. You know, I've got um, I've got blues trade and fours in all these different keys. So you could uh, you could learn your lick in all twelve keys. Maybe take it around the cycle of dominance or the circle of fours. <laughs> You know, you could just keep going all the way around the cycle of force and uh, learn it in all 12 keys, then maybe put on blues in different keys and practice it that way. Okay, so um, to finish up with, why don't I just play the chord on piano? I'm going to play a B flat 7 chord and I'm going to play the lick so that you can hear it in context with a chord with a dominant chord and then uh, and then I'll play the lick I'm mean, or I'll play the piano chord again and then you'll have an opportunity to play it with a piano chord if you'd like and remember it doesn't have to be just used on a blues you can use it on tunes where you have a moment you know maybe a bar or two on a dominant chord bits and pieces of this lick would work really great just on dominant chords okay so uh, this will be a good one for the practice room <laughs> 